Hello, everyone, and welcome to the new session of our webinar series on Historiana and on how to use Historiana to teach history from different angles. After I've been spoken about coffee and global history and about Bologna and the rise of medieval universities and local history, today we are speaking about paintings of everyday life, so about art history and how to embed that into our history lessons. My name is Alicia Modena. I am the professional development coordinator at Euroclio. Today's host will be Ute Ackermann Boyers, who is a member of the Historiana Teaching and Learning Team and a member of the Euroclio board. Um, Ute, take it away. Hello, everybody. Good evening. And I can see I'm really excited to see where people come from. Lovely, we have somebody from South Korea, from Tallinn, from Iceland, United States. So it's, it's super interesting. This is always a nice thing about the webinars to see where people come from. So as Alicia already said, I'd like to talk to you today a little bit about how we can use art and in particular genre painting in our history class. The title of today's webinar is Painting of Everyday Life. And my focus question, if you want, is how can we use a genre art effectively in the history classroom? And I will use mostly paintings or only paintings that we find in our Historiana collection so that you can also later on see where and how you can use the paintings that I use in that PowerPoint presentation today. Right. I just would like to start with showing you a picture and maybe we can brainstorm how you would use or how could you use this painting in a history classroom and first of all we have here a little bit of the date when it was created it was created 1854 and the question is just have you used something like this or how would you use this painting in a history classroom so that would be normally how i would also maybe start a history class i would ask you so what can you actually see what can you observe so I was looking at the picture and actually thinking about more of those pictures of everyday life. And one of the ways how to use them is to kind of contrast what is pictured on the painting and what is actually written in a textbook or, or a story told because sometimes well, I'm coming from my country's textbook experience, because oftentimes when there is a talk about simple people, simple living, the stories are quite dark, like peasants, poor, terrible. And then here is a sort of the light that grandmother and child doing things together to talk about what the area life might have been for people, because there were good times as well. My name's Lois and I'm from the United States. When I look at this, I think there's a continuity of the role of women. So I probably would uh, see, think, wonder it with the students without saying anything. What do you see originally? What do you think? And I'd probably adjust the question. What do you think's going on? And how do you wonder how this connects to today? That's probably, I mean, I really see the role of women here. This is regardless of where it was painted or where it's from in the world. I would also go with the women and also maybe something like industrial revolution or something like that, how life has changed. I, I think actually that's a great idea. And I have it also on the big screen in front of me, which is really very big. And I can see a lot of the details there. And I think this painting, for example, would be to learn a little bit more about the material culture at the time. Yeah. And I was uh, reading also some commentary on that. This could be also a picture focusing on the different generations you have in the background, the old woman sitting there, maybe having a little nap and there's the, the spinning wheel next to her. Then at the front, you have maybe the middle generation and then the younger generation. So there are many, many ways of how we can use that. And I think it's also interesting, that's something I will talk about a little bit more later. It's interesting to see how the houses were furnished, what kind of tools may be used, what kind of kitchen utensils. So we can actually learn a lot. And what Lois said to, to wonder and maybe to ask students, what kind of questions could you ask when you are looking at this picture? I think that's, that's very, very interesting. Okay, so, well, this is taken from the Historiana website and on the website we always have also those kind of comments and you can see that this is a mother who is preparing dinner and uh, maybe to answer a question she's watched by her daughter and another woman 
maybe the grandmother, maybe another family member is sitting at the background. She's taking a nap next to a spinning wheel. And it's interesting. We can see very detailed interior of the cottage. We can understand a lot of the construction, how low the ceiling was, for example. We can see the ovens here and how cooking was done. And as I said, what kind of tools the woman would use in order to, to peel the carrot, for example. It's just a knife, I think. And uh, so in Historiana, we have also some additional information. And here, this is about the artist. And uh, the artist is considered as one of the most prominent members of the so-called Brandbrook colony. So a group of 19th century painters that took inspiration from Flemish masters. And we will see some of the Flemish paintings later on. And think about the following questions. Have you used paintings in your history classroom? How have you used the paintings? Have you used them maybe really as historical sources? Have you used them just as illustrations? Why have you used the paintings? And what do you think are the pros and cons of using paintings as historical sources in the classroom. So these are again some ideas I would like us to exchange. I do remember that art was used quite many times during my lessons. Like I remember when I studied something about epidemic history mm -hmm. and my teacher used a lot of paintings that the people at that time depicted the ep epidemic and it shows Mm -hmm. how people at that time understood the epidemic, like how they depict all the gods and everything because they interpret the epidemic as like religious judgment. It's mm -hmm. very interesting. And so I, I'm really interested in this topic. <laughs> it's something to do also with perspectives, right? With mm -hmm. the perspective of the artist. And then at the same time, the perspective of the person who is looking at the art. And it depends then probably also from the time. I would be particularly interested in hearing how you have used the paintings and art in your history classrooms and why you have used them. Maybe from the first breakout room, you can one can sum up your discussion. Uh, I'm using both older paintings, usually introducing the institution of slavery and mm -hmm. how you know they're in the background. And I told them about a modern painter here in the United States, it's really addressing historical issues, especially the institution of slavery. His name is Titus Kafara. But I start with a lot of modern paintings and then, but I really need to know the Dutch masters. I just don't have enough art history knowledge, you know, the pros and cons of using it as historical sources. The teacher's got to know the painting and the history around it. So I'm just interested in learning. I would like to add just the idea that when you look at the paintings about people in the past, it helps to understand that things change quite a lot because the art changes and what is pictured. Like Lois said, people in the background, people in the foreground, the how people are pictured, in what poses, in what clothes, with what things. It tells quite a bit about the society they lived in and how they perceived themselves. So it's quite uh, interesting to look at the pictures like from the 17th century and uh, discuss with boys in my classroom what clothes were considered fashionable and mannish at the time and what kind of shoes like <laughs> the heels and things like that, how things change or, or the per perception of what is suitable changes and so yeah, pictures are, paintings are great for that. So actually, you, you all touched upon things I want to talk about now a little bit. I will just move on to tell you a little bit about genre art, what it is. And <clears throat> actually, they can be very powerful tools in the history classroom. And now in this webinar, I want to focus on genre art and how it can be used effectively by history teachers. And uh, we are going to use examples from the Historiana collections paintings of everyday life. And I'll show you also later where you can find the website. We will look at how genre paintings can be integrated into teaching source analysis and source analysis skills to enable students to develop a better grasp of a historical period using visual aids. And I think that that can be quite, quite an advantage of using paintings. It allows students to really get this feeling for a period. And as some of you said already, this includes understanding the context, the artistic conventions, and discussing the purpose, or students should be able to understand the purpose of the painting. They should be able, or they should learn how to make inferences. 
how to develop interpretations and becoming aware of different perspectives. So there are quite a lot of things. I just repeat that again. So we need to know the context, the artistic conventions at the time, understand the purpose, making inferences, developing interpretations and becoming aware of different perspectives. But at the same time, of course, we will also look at the pitfalls, and that's an expression used by Peter Burke, who is also in the bibliography. He wrote a really good and helpful book about how we can use art in the history classroom, so I would recommend it. It's very, very useful. And he says there are also pitfalls of using art in the history classroom, and we're going to see what we might have to be aware of. And finally, another focus of the webinar will be the use and application of Historiana e-learning activity builder, because that would allow you to actually use the paintings and create e-learning activities for your students. Right, so let's move on. So when we use arts and artifacts in the classroom, as I say, art and artifacts are always seen as primary sources. So that's that's quite a useful and interesting thing. And they can help us, as I said, understand more about the period. And the types of arts can be manifold. We can have all sorts of images, paintings, illustrations, for example, photographs. We can use monuments. And the monuments can be either taken as a photograph or we can visit the monuments. Of course, written sources like poems that that could be used as art or that could be seen and used as art and used in the classroom but also music the lyrics of music for example and i think traditionally well history teachers or historians have not used art that much and that is often also mirrored in the classroom if i remember my textbooks they they often have pictures or images, but they are more used as illustrations, not really as historical sources. So traditionally, historians have preferred to deal with texts and political or economic facts, not really the deeper levels of experience that images can actually probe and emotions that Im images can also create. So in order to use artifacts and art in the classroom, Educators need certainly to collect information about the artist, as I said before, the artistic conventions, the periods, and many more details. And of course, this can be challenging because maybe we are not experts, and it can, of course, also take up additional time. So there are always reasons why we may not use those. How can you use paintings to teach history? Not only to teach history, but of course, also historical thinking. And I just want to show you well what we have what examples we have in historiana that are not focused only on genre art before we actually go directly to that so you see on the left side a book illustration from circa 1170 and again we can already learn a lot of detail when we look carefully again it's a woman she's spinning so the book illustrations especially from a medieval religious texts can be very useful but not only western texts so we can also look at many manuscripts <clears throat> from other cultures that can be very very enlightening i would say then of course we have political cartoons and we have a number of them also in our historiana collection we have paintings like for example the battle of waterloo it depends also if the artist is actually was he present when that battle happened is it more like historiographer is he almost taking some sort of photograph or is it an artist who is painting in his studio and has never been present at that particular battle and then of course we have other paintings like the the graves at Kandara, which have a very different function so they have a very different purpose the artist certainly wants to express something very different than maybe giving a, a realistic let's say representation of what happened and apart from this we have lots of photographs in historiana as well and so the question is how do we use art in history teaching well as i said before we can use it to illustrate historical events to just give us a little bit of an idea what happened but we can also use it and i think that is probably the challenge we can use it to understand and to develop a feeling for a historical period and for our students 
for our learners to, to develop that feeling of a historical period. If you want to use it to illustrate historical events, as I just showed you before, we could use these paintings showing, for example, battle scenes. But if you want to get a feeling for a historical period, and that is something that you also mentioned before, if we have everyday scenes or we can get an idea about the buildings or the fashion, as you mentioned, how, did, how were people dressed at the time? So that gives us more an understanding of the material culture of a specific period. But then, of course, we can also use it to teach historical thinking, involving describing, analyzing, evaluating and constructing interpretations based on primary sources, in that case, our painting, and with the aim of constructing a historical narrative of some sort. So, and when using art, that goes, of course, much, much deeper. And hopefully it will enable students to develop also transferable skills that will allow them to analyze other sources and other images. So I want to briefly go on talking what is considered genre art. And well, we've seen that already in the first picture, we got a little bit of an idea. So additionally, genre art is seen as a pictorial representation from everyday life. This can be markets, domestic settings, interiors, celebrations, parties, weddings. Very often we have inn scenes, so from pubs we have street scenes. The representation can be very realistic, but it can also be imagined or even romanticized. And that's something that we need to be aware of when, and students when they use historical or when they use genre art as a historical source. What I said before, there was the golden age of the Flemish Baroque, the Dutch golden age. And well, these genre motifs, they were very popular. People had them in their houses. They often, as I said, they often showed also romanticized scenes. But genre art cannot be only seen in paintings. Other objects were often decorated with, with scenes of everyday life, such as porcelain or furniture, wallpapers or textiles. So we can have a, a wide variety where these pictorial representations of everyday life can be found. So the next question I would like to look at is how and why can genre art be an effective tool in the history classroom? And no worries, you will see a lot of paintings later on. So it's not only writing. So we can actually use it for our students to understand daily lives of ordinary people. Again, that's something that you said at the beginning. And we can get an insight into a life that we normally would not get. It's a kind of snapshot of a specific event. It can also help students understand social divisions. Again, that was mentioned before. In many ways, it allows us to imagine the past more vividly. It helps us to actually visualize the past and, of course, also past civilizations. And paintings can be some sort of records of acts of eyewitnessing. They can maybe also in that respect serve as historical evidence. But what are the pitfalls? Now, as in other sources, the origin, the purpose, the content of the source needs to be assessed of the painting. And of course, we need to be aware that the art and the paintings represent the artist's perspective, his interpretation of events. And therefore, we should know your artist. You should know what is uh, his or her background, what is their purpose, when did they live? And we see that in some of the pictures later on, what were they interested in, for example. And of course, for us, it's also important then for students to learn that they have to assess the reliability of a source, then understanding the artistic conventions of the time, and as we said before, making inferences. And of course, there are some dangers, and some dangers could be, for example, paintings could also serve as a propaganda, or they could portray stereotypes. So these are things that students need to be able to understand. And now I want to start with uh, examples from Historiana. So I, I found this very nice graphic organizer from the Smithsonian, and it uh, shows us the learning to look strategies. So you could make your observation first. What do you see? Then you can make an interpretation. How would you interpret that? And then a final reading. And I want to show you in the next slide an example. 
and that's taken from the website, it's quite helpful. And it's, I put it also in the bibliography. Here we have a painting of a woman with her child. And you can see on the left side, we have the observation. So what do we see? We have an older woman and a young boy. The two people stand close together. We can see that she has her arm around him. Then the boy wears bright colors. They has a pattern of vines on his vest. The woman wears dark and a more simple clothing. And then, of course, there's also the book and the boy is pointing at the book. And then on the other side, we have the interpretation. Okay, so that they might be family members that we have the different generations. Yeah, and that the young boy might represent youth, the future, new growth, that the woman is representing the past. And books are often used as symbols of education. And of course, this is something that we need to know in order to interpret the painting. And then we have at the bottom, the final reading. So this is an exercise you can actually also do with your students in class. Now, I just want to show you the Historiana collection where you can find it. So you can see here the various collections that we have. And many of them, of course, are working with images. Yeah. So we have, for example, visual representations of women at work and so on. So just wanted to show you that Historiana has many, many different source collections with paintings, cartoons, postcards, and so on. Now I want to look at our examples. So the first example, which we have in Historiana is this one. I hope it's clear for you because it's quite interesting because the background is very dark, but then we have this splash of light in there. And the title of that one is a philosopher giving a lecture at the orrery. And um, maybe I give you a moment to just look at it and, and think what you might see. And then I give you the background of the artist. So what do you think is represented in that painting? So we can see approximately the time. We can see some children here. This is the philosopher here. What do you think this might represent? I was looking at the light and the children and the, the way the light is shining and kind of illuminating uh, from the time, 18th century, this is the century of enlightenment. So it might be the knowledge, uh, the light of knowledge, something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. So we can see here the philosophy, that idea that, that knowledge is bringing light into the world, right? And so, as you said, it depicts the key idea of enlightenment and also this idea of empirical observation. And the painter, the artist, he lived in Bath and he was a part of a group that explored general interest in the sciences. So he was very much involved in sciences. And we can observe the contrast between light and darkness. And well, this is the philosopher here. And he, he actually demonstrates how the solar system works. He's using a clockwork model, that's the orrery. And you can see that the figures appear to reflect Newton's theory of the universe. And you can also see the illuminated faces of the children. So very clearly does this idea of knowledge, of curiosity, of enlightenment. And I think this is nicely demonstrated with this contrast of light and darkness. And so this is, of course, a romanticized and idealized depiction of a philosopher. So something that, that we should be aware of. Now, the question here is, how could you use this painting in a lesson of enlightenment? And uh, we have that again here. And I think you said that already, that you could use this, for example, in order to demonstrate specific ideas and this idea of what enlightenment actually meant. Yes, I think it's a delightful painting. I've seen it, but I never thought about using it during the Enlightenment. But I'm always trying to compare the French and the Brits, too, in terms of Enlightenment. So that would be a nice connection. Mm -hmm. I laugh because I would definitely point out that look at those little faces so excited to learn. And I expect the same face of each one of my 35 <laughs> students looking at me with total adoration. And then I thought in the United States right now, everybody is doing STEM and they're getting a lot more money than history teachers. So I'd be like, darn it, you know, that, that sexy solar systems in there. The sexy solar system. Nice alliteration as well. <laughs> okay. So I have another painting. So we could simply use, what can you see? Who is there? We could ask very simple questions to get a discussion in the classroom possibly going. When do you think it happened? 
how so how did you actually teach yeah we can use all those questions and why what is the purpose of this painting and then again we could use for example this kind of graphic organizer in order to note down the findings i have another one and again this painting is is a tavern scene well it's an outdoor tavern really and he liked to paint also village fairs and the life in the countryside in general and we can see that earlier from 1638 and according to what I read, it was very much influenced by Rembrandt. Yeah, and you can see here the travelers resting. And you can see if it's clear enough for you, many, many details. Again, somebody was talking about clothes and fashion at the time. So you can uh, very clearly see the kind of shoes people were wearing. Then we can see the satchel. We can see the hats, the pipes that were smoking. And we can see the inn owner possibly talking to the two guests. They have a nice and vivid conversation. So we can get a lot of detail. We can see the old trees and a little bit of the building in the background. And again, we can learn a lot about material culture from this painting. Again, the what, the who, the when, the how, and the why. So it would be a very similar approach again. So what I thought for us to do now is I have some examples of your uh, paintings that we will find on Historiana. I would love if you could, on the Padlet, add your, let me just open that so that you can see that, add your comments and maybe your thoughts of how you could use this example in the, in the classroom. We had an interesting breakout discussion on red because you showed the painting of the philosopher and I asked if red also was a symbol, but red means so many things. It has a very hard life as a color. That is also probably something that could be done as well. You find different paintings with different uses of yeah. the... Exactly. And of course, in that context, is it's important that we use the context. So when was the painting created? Because when this philosopher was created, we didn't really have red yet as the color for communism. But this idea that red is a signal color and is used for many different, in many different contexts, certainly... And, and that is actually interesting to make a comparison. But again, as I said, you would have to be aware of the context. When was the painting made? Maybe the color red in this, in this particular context had a special particular meaning. Yeah. meaning. Absolutely. That's a, that's a very interesting conversation. So um, I, I would like to hear how, how you would use some of these examples or what you thought about some of these examples that we have in our Historiana collection. Most of our attention went to the sixth one because we were looking at those travelers in the third class compartment, yes. And then we were discussing that the title of the painting says actually quite a lot because third class compartment implies that there is second and third and then you start looking at the people and it's quite obvious that this is not perhaps the best compartment and then we had this uh, comparison to the subway like people traveling somewhere and kind of looking in front of themselves because that's what you do in a public transport and then we looked at the third picture as well and kind of comparing the two of them because one of them is kind of traveling and perhaps working and the third one is a celebration but also in the description there is a set that people wear simple clothes so they have perhaps they're from the same social class mm -hmm. so how would the people traveling look like and be clothed and how would the people like celebrating uh, what clothes they would wear and then we discussed that we could ask them to place this painting in history looking at the fashion yes the painter died in 1939 but obviously looking at the women's clothes it's latest to beginning of the 20th century or then we could discuss if in some places more rural places the clothing worn was like not terribly fashionable and, and things like that so you could do a lot with a painting and kind of discuss social class means of travel clothing fashion differences between different places like city and rural life and there's really a lot that you can do with a painting. Absolutely. And yeah. would you 
Would you also say that if the painting three, this is also a, some sort of romanticized, you have this really nice sunset almost. Yeah, and I, I think it's quite interesting, as you say, we can actually look also at social classes, social divisions. And I liked what you said about example six. People, some of them, they are staring, you know, they have their own thoughts. And of course, if you look at the colors, they're all quite dark and a little bit dull even, right? So what could that actually, what might the artist want to show us with that? Yes, and uh, I actually had this question that the lighting in the picture, it's coming from in front of them. We were discussing if it was sunset or sunrise, like you can't really tell. Uh, I would say it's sunset, but I'm not sure. And then I was thinking it's a train and I never knew that in a train there would, would be such big windows at this time. So if it is a train or a ship, or something else, uh, actually, I have no idea. And of course, we could also ask the students, do you really think this is a realistic uh, depiction of yeah. a department? Or maybe the artist wants to show us something particular. Yeah, maybe. So what is the purpose of drawing that in that way? What does he want us to think or what does he want us to understand? Okay, let's have just a quick look here. There's an everyday life scene. Okay, so, and it's quite interesting because is it an everyday life scene? That's a question mark here. Yeah? And somebody wrote here that I would use this painting in order to develop a discussion about the quotidian life of upper middle class women during the 19th century. Yeah, it's very interesting. And then we have also a comment in the chat from Lois that says that there is a nice activity that you could set up of rural versus urban life. And then we could, of course, put it into the context of civilization. And maybe, again, that some painters want to make, as you said, to point out that contrast between urban life, between that life in, that is now dominated by factories, by bad air, with that clean and beautiful evening scene and then dancing happily into the sunset nearly. So this is just something for us to think about. You could, how you could use the images from the Historiana collection and we had already some ideas there. And I, while we were talking about genre art, certainly you could see that Historiana has many, many more collections. And what could be some difficulties or some obstacles for you to use these? And how would you introduce the use of genre art to your students and genre art his, as historical sources? Can you think about how you might use that? The only obstacle I'm thinking of is myself. I'd really like to know much more about those paintings. It's like those two women. I don't know much about the upper class of women and that kind of stuff. I think it's a wonderful question, but again, I can't teach what I don't know. So I'd have to do a little bit more investigation. That's what I think the obstacle is me, that not the kids. Actually, that's what I said initially, right? It needs more work from our side. It needs more preparation, more reading up, because you want to use it in a good way, right? You don't want to use it just superficially. You want to be sure that you know what you're talking about. The first thing about obstacles, I was going to say technical problems, like if I plan to use internet connection or the projector or something like that, and they are not working, but those tend to be kind of not usual situations. But in answer to Lois' remark, I thought that sometimes if you have like older students, older people, something 15, 16, you can actually sort of learn with them. I have this beautiful painting, but I don't know much about it. What can we learn together? But in that case, you need to kind of prepare this way of how you research and how they present later what they have found and things like that. So it can be absolutely a great way to get to know more. But in that case, you need to know those young people very well that they are ready to accept that uh, the teacher does not know anything and is ready to learn with them, something like that. Yes, I agree. There can be sometimes technical challenges, right? It depends where you are. If you have a school that has good internet connections or if you have students that can also use, for example, Padlet is a, a really nice tool where you can actually also go into detail of the pictures and it, you can see the colors very clearly. And that, not, that might not be available to every school, to every student. 
yeah, I can see that as a very significant obstacle. And if you want to make printouts, well, that's also quite costly if you want to make good color printouts. So there are also some of these obstacles. I just think the lesson through the pandemic for me has been that they need it in their hands and that the analysis in person, just from my point of view, that analysis is much richer when it's in person and it's in their hands. When yeah. I'm doing online, they kind of disconnect, but they really get into it and they always see stuff that I don't see. I think through the pandemic, we learned a lot of things about learning. And yeah, as you say, often the, the tactile things, the things that you have in your hand and the personal touch is very, very important. Absolutely. I agree with you. While the others think if they they have any other question or comment, I actually have a question. I'm Italian of origin. I live in the Netherlands. I've been living in the Netherlands for four years, but I was born and schooled in Italy. And in Italian high schools, there's art history. Art history is a subject that all students follow. So I went to a kind of high school, the one that prepares you for university, but it was the same in technical schools or vocational schools. We would have two hours of art and normally it would be one hour of technical drawing, which I personally find very useless because I ended up doing history, but you know, others might find very useful and one hour of art history. So is this something that is available at your schools? Because I was thinking maybe I remember, you know, for me, literature and art history, we would also look at the historical periods through the art. So maybe this could be a way to bring genre art into your classroom activity. If you don't feel comfortable with using the paintings yourself. But I see that in the United States, this is not generally offered in public high schools. I was just thinking that in our school and in Estonia, we actually have art that should include art history. But when I started looking closer at that program, like I was talking with my history students and I discovered like they know nothing. Uh, well, they learn, but they learn very narrow things and they don't have the historical perspective like they, there's, there's a bit from here and a bit from there and it's not chronological. They have simply this technique, this artist did that, those paintings are famous or drawings or statues and that's it. So they have this knowledge, but they can't actually put it anywhere in a timeline. When it comes to the United States, we do have at my school an art history class. The problem is the guy who teaches it wants to do drawing, so the kids don't take it. I just did the Spanish Civil War and did Picasso's Guernica. They were wildly excited about that and with no background. And so I think that in the history class, it's much more of a natural. But I think that a lot of the history teachers I'm dealing with are using art history in the history classroom. So it just depends on different public schools and how much money they have. They're all different around the country. I think it might also depend on the, on the school, whether your history and art teacher collaborates. I, I mean, I can talk about my school. We are American International School, but we teach also International Baccalaureate. And I know in the IB program for art, there's a lot of history and art history involved. So there's a big overlap. So they, so they have to do a lot of research about different historical periods and, and then how do they link it to art. But yeah, that is maybe, again, it depends on the school and also how teachers collaborate, I would say, in many cases. So if there are no more questions, I just want to show you the bibliography. And if you want, you can do a screenshot. And some of them, they have also the websites. So then I, I would say from my side, that is it. Thank you so much for taking part. But I think Alice wanted to show you also how you can use our e-activity builder on Historiana. I'll be super, super quick, but I just wanted to show you on Historiana. Okay. So this is Historiana. Uta showed us the historical content portion of Historiana which is where you can find all the sources. We are currently working on our tagging uh, and filtering system. It's been a massive, massive work. The web developers are finally putting that together. So far, I would type, for example, painting here and see what comes out or, I don't know, green and see what comes out. There's a lot of content there. We have source collections. We have collections of viewpoints. We have full-fledged units. 
what I wanted to show you is the teaching and learning part of Historiana. Well, actually, first the activity builder. The activity builder is this tool that you can use to get students uh, to engage with sources. You will need to log in, and then you can just you, know, you can ask your students to read some text, to answer some questions, to interact with websites that you have embedded, to sort sources following a specific background. So, for example. You can add sources and then you will be able to just ask your students to sort them, I don't know, left sources that deal with the public position of women and right sources that deal with private life. You can ask your students to analyze a source, to highlight on a written source, to compare sources, or you can build mind maps for students. You can also save sources that are on Historiana on your personal My Historiana page. What I wanted to show you, we have some e-learning activities that are ready to use that work with paintings. So I went into the teaching and learning section and we have two learning activities that actually are analog learning activities. So you will be able to download the lesson plan and some worksheets for your students to use in the classroom. And then we have a series of e-learning activities. So for example, we have, what would you change in a painting if you wanted to please a different audience, which helps you talk about the intention of the artist. That is something that you mentioned a lot today, everyday life and developing a sense of time and place, 16th century life in Northern Europe, very niche, the effect of gas on soldiers in the first world war. It's and also everyday life in the Netherlands inside the homes. And what you can do is for every learning activity, let's use this, you will see how it works. So in this activity, there is some text and then there's the painting. And then there's a question of why is this painting so popular and students can type here the answer. And then there is what would you change if you wanted to please a French audience? So it's a very, very short activity. You can do it as a homework or embed it in an online lesson if you're still in the online environment. Or maybe you're half in the classroom and half at home and the people at home can do this while you do a discussion with your students on the same topic. There's a lot of options that you have available. So yeah, if there isn't any last minute question or comment, Uthe, thank you so, so much for joining us today. Thank you for preparing the presentation. Thank you for walking us through the use of paintings. It was great.